je veux d'abord euh, remercier à toi, Nicolas, pour m'inviter ici. C'est la première fois depuis Covid que je suis à une conférence avec les, les gens en réel, en, 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 offline. Et alors c'est très, c'est super, mais c'est aussi effrayant. Euh, je vais se remercier, me remercier à Virginie Jordan pour, pour, pour l'assistance et à Nicolas Bourbon pour, pour m'aider avec la, les affaires technologiques. Comme Nicolas vous a dit, je vais faire cette intervention en anglais. C'est d'abord car mon français n'est pas bien, assez bien, mais aussi car pour moi, les langues ont des priorités, ou ont des, des priorités culturelles, des affaires qu'on y peut parler. Et pour moi, l'anglais m'a donné un accès, une ouverture pour parler et d'écrire du son. Et c'est pour cela que pour moi, c'est beaucoup plus facile. Um, touchant de parler en anglais, alors j'espère bien que, que ça marche pour vous aussi, euh, mais bien après on peut, on peut discuter, on peut, on peut parler en français, c'est pas de problème. Alors, hi. The title of my talk brings together two issues that are very much at the core of my research and my thinking around sound at this present moment. It brings together the notion of knowledge in relation to or as an issue of, as a matter of creation, understood as an organizing, ordering and as of a controlling of what we know and how we know and of who we know and what we can know that determines what carries value, establishes hegemonies and singular knowledge paths, and creates lines made from evidence and reference that always necessarily go into the path and are sing into the past and are singular. With a second issue that is listening across ordered, this, that the way that listening across ordered and these disciplinary lines and culturally gendered racial and national boundaries can disorder this knowledge to question the logic of its exclusion and pluralize its practices. To practice these two concerns with you today, I hope to present and perform an être à l'écoute, Jean-Luc Nancy's being in or according to listening that this symposium invites us into through its title, and which I understand as a disordering and uncurating being. A being in listening that challenges and disrupts conventional knowledge, its normative appearance and structures of display, which are organized and, re and legitimized through he hegemonic Western patriarchal lines of reference. And with that disruption and challenge to these lines of evidence and reference, a being in listening also challenges the ideologies and the, the histories that are hidden in these lines. The suggestion is that listening has the capacity to disorder the visual, taxonomical, and singular knowledge. And with that, it has the capacity to reveal, to reveal through the disorder and disruption the ideologies and power plays and investments that are behind these orderly lines. They, these are political, economic, social, etc., and that motivate and enable them and ultimately that normalize and perpetuate their linear thinking. I want to briefly say that when I say visual and taxonomical, I speak of course of a cultural visuality. We could look at the world in many different world ways, but the way we do generally culturally is through this very taxonomical, or orderly, organized way where we see things as individuated being and we're looking for reasons along these lines. Sound, when it is not musically orientated or semantically structured, does not speak in lines or through reference. 
but follows a relational logic as a logic of a dynamic between, it is not this or that, it's not me or you, but it is the space, the space between us, the space that opens itself in this room for us and with us. It is everything together, entangled, interwoven, codependent, and us with it. Therefore, it does not make maps, it does not make lines, lexica taxomina, but it makes volumes as a relational dimensionality. So the sound does not make a room that has walls and ceilings and windows and that is clearly identifiable on an architectural map, but it creates this volume as a voluminous dimensionality in which individuation is disabled and everything sounds in relation to everything else. And we, we become auditorily aware of our interbeing. So our être à l'écoute is an interbeing à l'écoute, an interbeing in listening, where we hear ourselves being heard too. It is vibrational, it is open, it is where we are reflected in each other rather than in one mirror. And of course, where we also are reflected in the more than human things that um, surround us and with whom we are. So Etre l'écoute is being intertwined in the world as such a volume, being part of this volume, being complicit as we listen from our ears to our hands to our feet, moving from listening to doing and walking as an extended practice of what we hear and what we are. This entanglement is not passive, but continued in what we do, how we act in a world as sonic beings, as interbeings, enacting being in listening. And I bring you here a little score that, um, to practice that interbeing in listening practically. Listen to an object you think is still. Listen until you can hear it move. Make that sound with your hands. The sense of this entangled and intersubjective volume is not found in a taxonomical, essentially Kantian and modernist system of knowledge. Even if you've never read a book by Immanuel Kant at all, your thinking will inevitably be um, as a Western European thinking, um, Kantian, without ever knowing it, and it, as it informs the modernist system of knowledge with which we live every day. And this system has, since Enlightenment, increasingly favoured mechanical objectivity over sensorial sense, and produces a cultural objectivity that eschews the body, the ears, the hands, the mouth, the feet, because it considers them as unreliable. Instead, it aims for metrics, and measurements and objectivity understood as universalizing this passionate, unrelated to a subject position, and it installs distance as the ultimate criterion for legitimacy. If we determine distance as the bearer of legitimacy, sound cannot um, obey or be within this criterion. It is impossible for sound to be at a distance, and thus, culturally speaking, it is impossible for sound to carry legitimate knowledge. Since instead, sound engages us close up, on the skin, and it reads objectivity, with Karen Barad, as responsibility. Where knowledge is found on the body, and in a contingent exchange with other bodies and other things in a process together, touching and being touched. Even unconsciously, and as a cultural determination, enlightenment and modernity haunt us with their aim for objectivity and determine our faith in lexica, taxonomies, dates and data, which legitimate the real by opening gaps and pretending the possibility of distance, to be neutral, non-orientated, indifferent to our own position and subjectivity or the context of our thoughts and actions. This haunting generates a scientism in philosophy and the arts, generating a philosophism and an artism that, like scientism, pretends that the Western notion of a Western notion of absolute truth, or how Glenn Aiken puts it, an understanding of science as objective, non-humanistic, rational, universal, and empirical, not connected to cultural values or location, gender or racial specificity, etc. To preserve this truth, the standard bearers of knowledge exclude sonic intimacy. They have to exclude sonic intimacy. 
the embrace that sound calls us into, its relationality and closeness that defies conventional notions of objectivity, distance and legitimacy, and carries the rigor of its sensorial sense, whose subjective nature makes it appear disorderly, unstandardized and unstandardizable, unreliable and even vague. And through these tropes, it is associated with the feminine and the other. The unrecognizable and what cannot be read, that holds that less value and can be ignored, and has to be ignore, ignored and excluded to keep order and to stay on the line. In response, I want to relish sounds disorder, not as a stance against communication and truth or knowledge, but in acknowledgement of the price we pay for, that the price we pay for order lies in exclusions, in what we have to get rid of to keep the line, what we ignore to keep a pattern, and what we reject to stay structured and recognizable. Because the lines and shapes we build in curation as an organizing of knowledge and artifacts to make them recognizable, valuable, readable, <coughs> are ideological and they are colonial. They're informed by money, bodies, land, and power. Kate Modin is a convenient stand-in here um, to make a point and show a line. Many other knowledge institutions and museums could be shown on this slide. But it has a very direct line to the ships from Africa to deliver slaves, to the plantation that meet the lines that deliver sugar to Europe, meet the lines that build a canon of what is good art, valuable, important, what carries knowledge and how to organize it. These are lines that make a map of art, sugar, and the colonial effort, and our knowledge. These are lines of power gained and lives lost and money made that determine the lines of art and knowledge, whose knowledge and whose aesthetic, whose order is considered orderly, who is in charge to take care of this order to create it, which is a process that always inevitably, inevitably has to stick to lines, but we can also queer the line. This is of course not to say that every curator is necessarily colonialist. That is another debate that we could have, but it is to say that the institution of the museum and not other knowledge institutions and its structure of display and organization and communication is colonial. The curatorial organization of knowledge in lines of evidence and reference is colonial and it is a cultural colonialism that is invisible, that is hidden in the line. We listen on the line to the line architectural, musical, artistic, geographical, semantic and so on to hear as recognition and confirmation a legitimated present and are deaf to anything else and thus unable to move our hands and feet in a different way. But what about that which is not on the line and is not in the canon, that finds no reference in a system that is closed off? Hélène Sixou and Catherine Clément talk of women who cannot find themselves in history and have to invent themselves. What is my place if I'm a woman? I look for myself throughout the centuries and don't see myself anywhere. <coughs> Where to stand, who to be. They invite me to give up on a lexical definition and call myself in my own name, in my own story, to write my own story, our own histories, her stories. I do not have to look for myself in history where I can, according to um, Sixou and Clément, cannot be found anyway. So instead of looking for a person who is not there, who is, or who is only there in a falsified image, in a historicized image, I have to invent myself in listening, in singing, in dancing. Without fear of definition, in the certainty that the song will let me transform and change. In sound, I, can, I am becoming a subject not through the name, the lexicon, the structure of the semiotic, but through the movement of the body with hands and ears and feet that calls itself. 
But I do not mean to reduce this exclusion to women, but invite everybody to think more critically of how they are organized in the lexicon and whether they feel, whether you all feel represented by that description or whether you want to call yourself by a different name to gain a space and reflection for a different possibility. So we could ask, what is my place if I am? Fill in as required. Where to stand, what, who to be. So it is. Um, use it to, put, to write up your own lines and think how you live, your identification, to rethink its source and norms of living in the entanglement of a sonic volume rather than on a visual map. It is from our own lines to history of how we want to live them, how we want to orientate ourselves that we can come to understand the construction of the universal, the objective and apparently singularly normal. It is from the relational logic of sound as a feminist and decolonial logic of relational volumes that we can reflect on the objective and the relational, uh, the rational, as apparently not connected to cultural values, to location, gender and racial specificity to try what knowledge can be if it means to be a knowledge from the unreliable specificity of ears and hands and feet.
the record player did not play that sound. It's only turning and brings us to its own mechanical sound that we can't really hear in this room, but that you could if you'd listen to a record at home. So you'd hear the needle touching a line that is not straight, that does not move on linearly, but goes round and round, re-meeting and moving on in circles. And that line does not move outwards and onwards in a progressive sense, but comes from the outside to the middle, ever smaller, tighter, creating a point rather than a line. Instead of the record, we heard a river recorded and composed in a piece by Kate Carr entitled Hawks End, River So Junction, a sonic transect of the sometimes absent River Sherburne. The River Sherburne is a river that sometimes is not there, that disappears underground and yet flows on to surface again. It has been shaped by man and through urban planning into this undulation, appearing and disappearing existence that interrupts its open flow, its visible line to build a town. Design has organized its structure and created its path to serve a human purpose. Inadvertently, of course, this has also organized and created how people live and move in that town, where they can go with more ease because there is no more river, and where they can, what they cannot reach and what they cannot hear because the river, the river has been buried underground. Kate Carr is an artist and composer and researcher interested in transects. Transects are lines that allow geographers, biologists, anthropologists, etc., to draw a line and to research the field along its measure, rather than as an open field. By designing sonic transects, she at once uses and disrupts the line and shows how sound can expand the line, giving it time and volume the expanse of sound made from hands and feet, and she troubles the line through its own expansion, through how it sounds the limits and exclusions it must practice to stay a line. It is a fairly long piece, and in fact, she's composed it for the Coventry Biennale, which only opens in a couple of weeks, so we got a sneak preview. Um, it's not really um, available as a piece yet, but it's an hour long piece of a river that is there and that is not there. Oops. I don't know what happened right now. I don't certainly not what was meant to happen. This is what was meant to happen. Sorry about that. This disappearing of the Sherburne River meets the negative in the work and discourse of 60s and 70s sculpture that Rosalind Crowd writes about in her essay Sculpture in the Expanded Field in 1979. She talks about these sculptures as the full condition of an inverse logic, of a work that become pure negativity. And that is for her a kind of ontological absence. And that is exactly where I think the absence of the River Sherburne is so very different. It is not just an ontological absence, because an ontological absence is still a disappearance, a modernist disappearance of something that imminently resurfaces and is resubsumed into a modernist thinking and visuality that believes in an objective truth and ultimately in presence. In effect, the postmodern um, absence of Robert Morris and other artists that worked in his way is not unlike John Cage's silence, um, a negative that makes space for nothing in the museum, but it is not a disappearance from art, music or curation. Instead, it is a subsuming of nothing and thereby of everything into the curatorial order, just as much as John Cage's silence is a subsuming of everything in the order of the concert hall. It is, in a sense, if I want to be provocative, the ultimate tidy up in the negative. It's a hoovering outdoors as a definition of a postmodern madness at an epoch at its end that still tries to apply the same tidiness, that modernism, and the same legitimacy, the same standards of legitimacy and value and understanding as modernism did before. By contrast, sound does not order but disorders and disappears the work into the possibility of becoming anything 
and hooking up with other possibilities and disciplines. That que it questions the modernist belief of an absolute presence and truth that haunts Krauss's writing and that haunts, haunts I would um, say, all our senses of the real and that haunts also the curator, the museum and the gallery and even pedagogical institution as an agent and a, as a location of order. Thus, the river so has been made into a line and silence, and yet it keeps its sound and disappearance to make it design an underground world that we cannot see, but that has an impact beyond the visible, that bricks organize and straighten, but whose sound bounces into a diffractive plurality of what we cannot see. Underneath and in silence to all my talking, drawing, walking in Kay Carr's river, turned Ellen Fullman's line of the long string instrument played of In the Sea from 1987. That, and this long string instrument, which is literally what it says, it's an instrument of long strings that she plays, whose vibration she plays, brings forth a fuzzy geography fuzzy music, a fuzzy line. These are lines troubled by air and vibrating with everything, being with everything and listening in sound making. Being a letter put, that is, being as interbeing, where the line is never straight, square and tidy, but vibrates with everything and is made of and with everything that is surrounding is touching it invisibly to generate a volume of vibrational entanglements made from exclusions without drawing them into a certain line. Thank you.